Hey, grab your Bible there. Would you turn to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you have your Bible, make some noise. Hey. 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you do not have a Bible, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And if you didn't have a Bible uh, here today, you could uh, pull out in the chair in front of you. There's a rack underneath some of the rack. There's a Bible. You can pull that out and follow along in 2 Samuel. It's right after 1 Samuel. It's before Kings and Chronicles and all that good stuff. It's after the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. 2 Samuel 11. If you have it, say amen. 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 2 Samuel. And we're reading 21 verses today. Can you handle 21? All right, so 2 Samuel chapter six, uh, 11, verses 6 through 27 is going to be our text. But put your notes there, hold your place there, and uh, let's get started this way. How many of you, I've been asking this in all the services, how many of you in the room have, maybe it's not written out, but at least you have something mentally, uh, you have a, a personal mission statement for your life. Let me see your hand. You ever written something out? So you got a, per, that's excellent, personal mission statement. And uh, so that's good. If you don't have one, you might just want to write it down. Like this is a goal or a mission statement that I have for my family. Because when, when you look at a certain company, the mission statement, in fact, these companies will hire marketers and people to write out their mission statement because they want to know that, that this company, that they're going after something. And so, I mean, you know, we're going after something. And so I want to just share like four or five of them with you, famous, popular companies uh, out here. And uh, so number one, Facebook. Book. Here's their mission statement, to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. How many are on Facebook? Okay, and you never knew that, but that is their mission statement, to make the world more open and connected. Second uh, company is Tesla. If the Lord puts it on your heart to buy me one, I would love to drive a Tesla. Anyhow, their mission statement is to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport, whatever that means, by bringing compelling mass market electric cars to market as soon as possible. All right. Next company is Starbucks. Their mission statement, establish Starbucks as the premier purveyor of the finest coffee in the world. Nice try. Anyhow, uh, while maintaining our uncompromising pr principles while we grow. Finally, we have any people on Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. It's kind of going out, isn't it? All the young people are like, what, Twitter? Never heard of it before. Yeah. Anyhow, Twitter, to give everyone the power to create and share ideas and information instantly. Notice this last, last two words, without barriers. It's kind of funny because you're like shutting everybody down that doesn't agree with you. But anyhow, without barriers. Someone say without barriers. Um, I, did you know that your pastor has a mission statement? You want to hear it? Yeah. Drum roll, please. Here it is. It's not, it's not sexy. It's not sophisticated. It's not profound. It's not complicated. It's not as cool and nifty as all of those. My mission statement is just three words. Don't mess up. Let's all say it together. Ready, go. I know you're laughing and I'm totally serious. Like, don't, you're like, what do you mean don't mess? Like, I don't want to mess up my marriage. I don't want to mess up my kids. I don't want to mess up the church. In fact, I told Andy that a couple weeks ago. Like, my goal in life, just don't mess this whole thing up. And by God's grace, we've gone from 40 people to 4,000 people. I don't want to mess up our church. I don't want to mess, on, mess up with the calling that God's given me. I don't want to mess up my anointing. I don't want to mess up you. I don't want to mess up me. I don't want to mess up anything. Too much on the line. It's too costly. It's too intense. I can't afford to. And neither can you. And neither can you. That's my personal mission statement. You're like, that, that's interesting. Like, why, why did you come up with that? Because when I sat in a Bible college class many years ago, the professor looked at 30 students and said, 75% of you are going to mess up. You're going to have an affair. You're going to cheat on your spouse. You're going to walk away from the Lord. You'll no longer be in ministry. And honestly, I was only like saved for a year. I'm like, this guy's losing his mind. He's talking to Bible college students. And the further I've got in my, my walk with Jesus Christ, I've looked back 30 years ago, I go, exactly what he said is true. I've had so many pastor friends of mine, they messed up, they messed up their marriage, they messed up a second marriage, they're no longer in ministry, they're no longer serving the Lord. My personal mission statement is don't, what is it again? <laughs> don't mess up. And I'm gonna die one day like you are. Did you know you're going to die? The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed for man to die one time. No reincarnation. Shirley MacLaine does not know what she's talking about. You're going to die once. You're going to stand before God. So that day is coming, right? James says our life is like a vapor. The, the, the book of Job said it's like a blade of grass that grows up one second. It's mowed down the next. It's like a flower that fades. We are all going to die. And I hope, how many of you, at least put your hand up if you think you might possibly come to my funeral. You're not going? <laughs> Why not? So 
So I'm going to die one day, and hopefully I'll be praying uh, that somebody shows up at the funeral, and we're going to be out there at the graveside, not sure who's going to do it, and then you guys will all go to your houses, go back to your jobs, and then they're going to bury me into the ground, six feet under, and then they're going to put that tombstone, that marker, right? And it's going to say, here's what it's going to say, Stephen, don't be calling me by my first name, <laughs> Stephen P.H., middle name, don't judge me, Stephen Guy, why are you laughing? I didn't choose it. You didn't get to choose it. Right, Stephen Guy Abraham Jr., born March 4th, 1985. Died. I'm not sure when, when the, the death is going to be. It could be in a year from now. We don't know. 10 years from now, 30 years from now. And I just wanted to say on my tombstone, didn't mess up. That's all I care about. I could care less how big the church is. I just wanted to say, you know what? He served Jesus his whole life, and he, what did he do? He didn't. Too much on the line, too costly. I love God too much for me to mess up. In fact, I've had people in the church say, if you ever did something stupid with, with like a lady in the church, I would kill you. How many would kill me? And I'm like, too late. My wife would kill me first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and deservedly so, right? And we're studying David who started out really well, really well on the throne, and he's got servants, and his kingdom is expansing, and he's taking over territory, and he's defeating his enemy, and he started out really well, and I said last week, doesn't matter how you start, it's how you, it's how you finish, and I, I want to finish well. Last week, we said three things, David's choice, David's compromise, and David's consequences, and today, I'm going to give you three more points. Last week, three points. Today, three points. I'll make sure next week, there's no points next week. It's going to be a pointless sermon next week, but come anyhow, all right? So let's pray, let's dive in, and before I pray, I want you to look right into my eyeballs. I'll take my glasses off so you can see me. Who's looking at me right now? Okay, so here's what I want to say before I pray. If I were the devil, some of you think I am, but I'm not, but if I was, here's what I would want to convince you of right now. I'd want to convince you of a couple things. Number one, after Pastor Steve prays, don't really listen to him. He's kind of going to be ranting a little bit about compromise and sin, but the nice guy will be back next week. So I, I'd convince you and, uh, of not listening to the message. Don't, don't just like be distracted. I, I'd just say, hey, think about all the stuff on your mind this week. Think about work. Think about where you want to go to lunch after the church. And I would definitely try to convince you that if you even take notes and you hear the message, I would convince you of walking out of the building and not applying the message. That's what I would do. That would be my goal if I were the enemy. If I was the Holy Spirit, I would convict you all sermon long. I would have you sit up straight. I'd have you take notes, not for the person next to you, not for the person that you wish was here at church today. I, I would say you need to listen to this message. God's going to speak to your heart. I mean, the Holy Spirit convicts us. One of the things, Jesus said, when I go to the earth, I'm sending another one, the Holy Spirit. One of his jobs is to convict us of our sin. We all sin, and we need to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. So if I was the Holy Spirit, I'm not. But I would, I would say, hey, sit up straight, take notes, take heed. This is, a, this is like a warning, a caution today. I believe this message can save your marriage, save your kids, save your family, save your future, save you from going south in your life. So if I were the Holy Spirit, I'd say take this message really seriously. I thought I'd get more amens than that. I would say take this message very seriously. So, Lord, bless your word as it goes forth. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Convict us of our compromise. Convict us of our sin. We welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit in this room, but more importantly, in our lives. And if you love the Lord, can you give me a loud amen? amen. By the way, I haven't said this in a while. I preach way better when I get some feedback. I don't know who was. That was good. All right. I like that. I like that. So three things. We're going to look at the life of David. Three things. David's compromise from last week, and we're going to discover, leads him down three paths, three paths, and uh, I've got to take a little water break because I'm losing my voice. This is okay. Just turn to the person next to you and say something. <laughs> uh, his sin and compromise last week um, is going to take him down a path and we're going to discover three things. But look at this way. This is, I could have preached this last week. Verse 2 of chapter 11 said this. David saw Bathsheba bathing. Saul. Someone say Saul. In verse 3 it says David, second thing, David sent for Bathsheba. Saul sent. The third thing, the Bible says that David slept with her. 
See the, see the process? You see something, you send for something, then ultimately you sleep with it. That's what we talked about last week. So now, verse 5 of 2 Samuel chapter 11, if you weren't here now, Bathsheba, who's married to Uriah, and David, who's married, now she knocks on the door and says, Hey, David, David, i got to tell you something. I'm, I'm pregnant. Now, David has a choice. It's the same choice you and I have. Would you look at me? Same choice. Every time we fall on our face, every time that you and I sin, every time we compromise because, I mean, we're all going to sin. James says we all stumble in many ways. So we're going to sin, but we have a choice. Number one, are we going to fall down on our face before God and say, God, forgive me. I've turned from you. I repent of my sin. I, I call it what it is. It's sin. And here's what the, the, the word repent means. I was going in one direction. I had a bad attitude. And then God convicted me, and I changed my attitude. But it just means to go 180 direct, uh, degrees in the opposite way. So we have, every time we sin, we fall on our face, say, God, forgive me. I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to think that. I didn't mean to cuss her out, flip him off and trap, whatever it is, please forgive me. And how many know he forgives us? Yes. How many are grateful that he forgives us? Yes. And, or, or the second option is we, we, don't, we don't confess it. We don't repent of it. We don't turn from it. We, here it is, the word. The word is we cover it up. Yes. So he's, he's, can you see him out on the palace? He's like, she, she's pregnant. So what am I going to do? I, I should fall down and confess, but no, I'm not going to choose that path. I'm going to choose this path. There it is. Write it down in your notes. So number one, he chose the path, the, decept, the path of deception. Deception. Instead of covering, uh, confessing it, instead of coming clean, it led him down a deceptive, someone say deceptive. Notice in verse 6 and 7, so David sent his word to Joab. Joab is the commander of the army. David sent his word to Joab, send me Uriah. The Hittite, Uriah is Bathsheba's husband. And Joab sent him to David. Notice this. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Isn't that interesting in verse 7? Here's, do you think David really cared? He's not concerned about the soldiers. He's not concerned about Uriah or Joab. He is, here, here's what he's doing. He's pretending, he's faking, he's camouflaging. The same thing that we do. The same thing that we do. Okay, I didn't get an amen, so I'll, I'll say that. The same thing that I do. I mean, sometimes we, we just, we play a church game sometime on Sunday. You're fighting each other in the way you got, you kick me, you kick me, park the car, stupid church. You walk in there holding those welcome signs. Hey, welcome. Somebody says, how you doing? Oh, bless, brother. Dios le bendiga. You lying. You just got to fight with your wife. You yet you cussed your kid out. Because they spilled coffee in the car, and somebody says, how you doing? You go, oh, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Hallelujah. You lie, lie. I just want to be honest and say this. I have lied in the past to make myself look better. Anybody else in the room? And the rest of you are liars. You didn't raise your hand. I, I have lied in the past to project something that I really was. Hey, Pastor Steve, how many did you have at Easter? We had like 5,000. Oh, uh, 6,000? You lie. You're lying. You're lying. And I try not to do that anymore, but in the past, I have lied. I, I shared a story a couple months ago. Uh, Chrissy would know. Dr. Jim Scott spoke at our church. We went out to lunch after, and he's so smart. He's got a doctorate in theology, and he's talking to me about, like, all this stuff. And, and I'm like, I, I, inside, I'm like, I have no idea what he's talking about. But, Steve, you're a pastor. you got to at least act like you do. And he's talking about, like, preterism or something this. And do you think that, that the New Testament church is a fulfillment of Israel? And he's just, like, talking. And he said the worst thing ever. He said, Steve, what do you think about this? <laughs> instead, instead of saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. Do you want to know what I said? I was like, I could go either way. That is so pathetic. You're such a liar. Hey, why don't you just like be honest, Steve, and just say, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what pederism is, and I don't frankly care. But no, in order to impress somebody, I put on a facade. David's doing the same thing in verse 7. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll be in jeans and a t-shirt. I got my, it's kind of a non-work day on Fridays. I'm the only pastor that's here typically. And somebody in the church might say, they're like, you're so casual today. You're just like so ordinary. And that, listen, that's what I want to be. I just want to be ordinary. I'm just like you. My wife and I, once in a while, not that often, but once in a while, we get in little tiffs. Most of the time, it's her fault. <laughs> just kidding. Sometimes our kids will give us 
attitudes once in a while. They're, they're a lot better. They all love Jesus with all their heart. But once in a while, I get mad in traffic. Anybody else get mad in traffic once in a while? Or are you so holy? People keep cutting you off. And you're like, God bless you. Go in front of me. No, no. Sometimes I get mad. Like, there are so many bad drivers out there and slow drivers. Like, drive me, guy, guy. So I, I kind of lose it a little bit. And let's just be honest and say, hey, we all have issues. We're all in process. Nobody's perfect. I'm real. You're real. We're all on the same playing field, right? In fact, so I, I have a personal mission statement. Don't mess up. My personal song is, ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Ain't nothing like the Let's just be real. Sometimes you come to church and say, you know what? Actually, it was a horrible week. I got fired from my job. My kids are driving me crazy. Let's just be real. So David's playing a part in verse 7. Hey, hey, how the soldiers doing? How's Uriah doing? How you? you don't care. You're, trying to, you're, you're deceptive is what you're doing. I mean, all, everybody, we have two sides to us, don't we? The Bible says spirit and flesh. I say Christ-likeness and competitiveness. No traffic, traffic. I know, it's like, oh, and there's two sides to us, and David's playing the, the negative side. And so, he's, he, so instead of confessing a sin and calling it what it is, he goes down the path of deception. So check out verse 8. The Bible says in verse 8, then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Euphemistic for Uriah, go sleep with your wife. Put on some cologne, take a shower. You guys, why, why is he telling him to do that? Because if Uriah could sleep with his wife... And she's pregnant. The ultrasound comes back in a couple months. Then the blame is on Uriah and not David. Do you see how scheming this is? Do you know how deceptive this is? Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace. And listen, David gives him a gift too. Here's a gift card to Mastro's. Take her out to a nice restaurant. Verse 9. But Uriah, ch Check out the, the integrity of Uriah. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all the master servants and did not go down to his house. Verse 10, David was asked, or told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why don't you go home? Sleep with your wife. So I can cover this whole thing up. Verse 11, Uriah said to David, check out the integrity. The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, king, I will not do such a thing. Oh, dude, that had to, David, David covering the whole thing, oh, you know, that had to kill him. There's nothing worse when you're living a life of compromise as to be surrounded by somebody that's on fire for Jesus. When you're compromising and they're Christ-like, when you're, when you're getting involved in all kinds of crazy sin, they're like, let's go to church, let's read our Bible, let's go to that worship night, right? Nothing worse than being surrounded with people that have integrity, that are going passionately after Jesus Christ. You got to be careful this first step of deception. Here's what deception does. Check out this verse, Hebrews 3.13. You must warn each other every day while it is still today. Why? So that none of you will be What's the word there? Dece that's what sin does. It deceives us. And if you're deceived by sin, notice what happens. Our heart gets hardened against God. I told you from the beginning, this is a wake-up call. This is a caution. This is a warning. Let the Holy Spirit convict you. This is not a message for someone else. This is a message point for who it's for. It's for me. Cold water in the face. Here's what deception does. Deception turns your heart hard toward the things of God and the people of God. I, I, was, I was just thinking about this. Isn't the enemy like this? He wants sin to look attractive and appealing. Ladies, here's what he does. He says, trade in your loneliness because you're lonely and you're insecure and just go out and have a one night stand with somebody and you'll wake up and you'll be a lot more fulfilled and you'll lie. You're still going to feel lonely. Just go out one night, just do a little parting, just sleep with them one night. Yeah, but you might just get a venereal disease. And he talks to you about how appealing sin is. He never talks about the consequences, right? He makes everything look alluring, and it's deceptive. Check this out, Jeremiah 2.18. God says, now why go to Egypt to drink from the water from the Nile? And why go to Assyria to drink from the water from the Euphrates? Both the Nile and the Euphrates were dirty rivers. 
God wants to know today, would you, would you look at me? God wants to know, why do you keep going back to the boyfriend? Well, he said, he said he's a Christian, but he's not. I know, but I'm kind of talking to him a little bit. And he says he believes in God. Awesome. So do the demons in hell believe in God. So you're dating Satan. That's awesome. That's great. Why do you keep going back to him? Why do you keep going back to your girlfriend? She, she's not a Christian. You, you have something. You don't have anything in common. You're going one way trying to serve God. They're going in a different direction. Listen, God sent you from fear. He released you from that. Why do you keep going back to fear? He says, do not be anxious. Remember you came forward on a Sunday morning and he took anxiety from you. Why do you keep going back to anxiety? Why do you keep going back to insecurity? Why do you keep going back to the bar? Why do you keep going back to drinking? Why do you keep going back to the website? Those are dirty rivers. God already set you free from that. And I'll tell you, when you go back to the river, you start justifying your sin and it becomes deceptive. And if you don't deal with deception, here's the second step. David, it led him down a dark path. And it's going to lead you and I down a dark path. Second word to write down is the word dark. Check it out in verse 14. In the morning, someone say in the morning. Uh, how, how well do you think David slept that night? So he woke up in the morning. So I'm thinking like palace. He's like back and forth and looking out the window and trying to scheme a plan. And how am I, I going to cover this up? And that didn't work. And Uriah didn't sleep with his wife. And what else can I do? And trying to fall asleep and, and sweaty sheets. And what am I going to do now? And in the morning, he wakes up and he's got he's to take it to another level. So David wrote a, David wrote a what? Letter. Check it out. I got, I got the letter right here. I got access to the letter right here. <laughs> David wrote a letter to Joab the commander, and sent it to Uriah. Here's what it said. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in the front where the fighting is fiercest. Check out how wicked this is. So put him out there where it's like, it, it's really raging. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Listen, that's what deception does. That's what sin does. That's what compromise does. It just gets worse and worse and worse. It takes you down a dead dark path. Verse 16, while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army, look at your Bible, what does it say? And they, moreover, Uriah the Hittite, what happened? I wrote this in my notes, like gasoline on a fire, sin covered, escalates out of control. Let me say it again, like gasoline on a fire, sin covered, escalates out of control control. Here's a question I have. When Joab got the letter from David, I got a question. Why didn't Joab send another letter back or a messenger back or email or send a text to David saying, hey, what are you doing? The last thing you and I need is to surround ourselves with people that enable us in our sin. Hey, you don't, hey, don't tell your wife what we did last week in Vegas. I won't tell my wife. Everything that happens in Vegas stays in Hey, don't tell your parents what we did on Friday night. You don't tell your parents, I won't tell my parents. Don't tell the boss. Don't tell them that I come in 20 minutes early every day. I won't tell them that you leave early 20 minutes every day. The last thing I need in my life is people telling me what I want to hear. I didn't say this in the other services. This is a super important quality in your life. You need to have a teachable spirit. So when a pastor or somebody that loves you speaks into your life, you're like, I don't care what they have, I'm doing my own thing. That's a bad spirit. You need to have a teachable spirit. I might not like it. I might not agree with it. But you know what? They're speaking on behalf of God. They're not, it's not because they don't like you. They're trying to prevent you from doing something stupid is the word. It comes to my mind. So have a teachable spirit. And if three or four people are saying the same thing, duh, it could be God. And so we're, we're like, Joab, why didn't you tell David you should be doing this? Here's what I want. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Steve, don't do that. Be careful of that relationship. Stay out of that way. Faithful are the, I need people that will speak uh, truth and grace into my life. Not what I want to hear, what I So here, will I cover my sin or will I come clean? Proverbs 28, 13 says this. He who covers his sin will not prosper. You cover it up, you're not going to prosper. Whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. I wrote this down. Cover up multiplies consequences exponentially. Cover up. It magnifies the consequence of our sin. How does it do it? Exponential. Someone say exponential. I really had a hard time in math. Really hard time. Especially I got into high school and you throw like a couple letters in with numbers. I'm like, what? 
So I had a hard time, but I get exponential. Here's exponential. Exponential is not 1 plus 1 equals 2 plus 1 equals 3 plus 1 equals 4. That's not exponential. It's not even 1 plus 1 equals 2 plus 2 equals 4 plus 4 equals 8. That's not exponential. It's 2 times 2 equals 4 times 4 equals 16 times 16 equals 256 times 256 equals I don't know the answer to that. That's what it means. It grows quickly, exponentially, and a rate that is out of control. And if you don't deal with the deception of your sin, it will take you to a very dark, dark place. And you do not want to go there. Let the Holy Spirit convict you today. Listen, you don't want to go there. So you might want to turn your notes over and write down these four things. Because I wrote, rationalization is the key ingredient to cover up. Rationalization is the key ingredient to cover up. Ready? Ready? Four things people that attend New Life should never say. Four things people at our church should never say. Ready for the first one? We should never say, number one, everybody is doing it. We used to get this in high school. Hey, Dad, um, there's a dance, and then after the dance, we're going to go to so-and-so's house. And uh, we heard there's not going to be any drinking and stuff, but, uh, like, everybody's going to go. In fact, there's a couple of people in the church, some of the youth group, like, no, you're not going. No, Dad, you didn't hear me. Some of the other kids in the church, they're going to. I know, but you are an Abraham. You Read my lips. You are not going. I know, but everybody's doing it. Not everybody in our house isn't doing it, and you ain't going. Don't say, hey, nobody else is our standard. No pastor in the church is our standard. No elder is our standard. If Jesus ain't doing it, I ain't doing it. Amen. Amen. That's good. I'm going to pre- Amen. First thing we should never, second thing we should never say, God made me this way. I heard this, I've heard this in counseling. Hey, I just, I know I lose my, I cuss my wife out all the time. I just got a bad temper. I'm Irish. Oh, so because you're Irish, you just get to go off on your wife? I, I, I've cheated on her a couple times, but you know, we're, come on, we're Italian. We're kind of Casanova. No, you're a new person in Jesus. You're a new person in Jesus. You don't get to justify your sin because of how you were raised or your ethnicity or your anything. God made me this way. I'm oh, just a player. <laughs> Number three third thing we should never say, I can't help it. I just kind of sleep around with everybody. I just party. I just can't, I can't help it. I can't. (sighs) Oh, Jesus said in every temptation, he's given you a way of escape. You can't help it. And then number four, finally, this is the greatest one. That's really good advice. I'll do something tomorrow. That was, I've, Pastor Steve's wife, she's so cute. She gets out and talks about the offering. And I've thought about tithing and stuff. I think we'll do, do it tomorrow. Maybe next Sunday we'll do it. Yeah, I think uh, maybe then. We'll start giving tomorrow. We'll start serving tomorrow. I'm going to start reading my Bible tomorrow. I, here it is. I've been putting on some weight. I'm going to start exercising and eating good. Because Mondays are a great day to start, right? I'm going to start doing it tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. I'm going to get serious about my marriage tomorrow. I'm going to really start cracking down on my kids. I'm going to do it. When am I going to do it? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. And Jesus is, no, today is the day. He's a today God, by the way. Today is the day of salvation. Choose you this day who you follow, right? If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart today. If you hear God speaking to you, do something about it when? Turn to somebody and say, you got to do it today. You got to do it today. So those are four lame things that we should say. I know, listen, I know my sin is hurting others. I know my sin is hurting me. I know it's unhealthy, but I think I'll do something tomorrow. Do you know the uh, plagues in the Old Testament? You know the one that really freaks me out besides the death of the firstborn? That's... The frogs. I, I, there's not too many little animals that I, I don't even mind snakes, but frogs for summer. And don't be bringing a frog to me in the lobby. Hey, this is my, no, they're slimy, they're nasty. I just don't like it. So check it out. So uh, Egypt wakes up, right? And God just a million frogs everywhere. Remember that in the Old Testament? How many remember that? Now, this is crazy. This is crazy. Because they're everywhere. They're in the cupboards, they're in your bed. Is that your hand? No, that's a, that's a frog. And, and here's what Pharaoh says to God. He says, this is insane. Pharaoh tells God, can you get rid of the frogs tomorrow? <laughs> what? How about our order? <laughs> now is what I'm thinking. Tomorrow, and how many of us say the same stupid thing? Tomorrow. 
I'm going to get serious about Jesus tomorrow. I'm going to be fully committed tomorrow. And I'm telling you, when never comes. You got to do it today. Because if you don't deal with deception, it's going to turn into a dark place. There's a third thing, and it's sad. Number three, it led him down a devastating path. It's going to be devastating. Verse 26, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. Notice this. But the thing that David had done, what? What does your Bible say? Look, well, I don't know why you're looking at me. The thing that David done had, it's underlined in my Bible. You can, if you can, I don't know if the cameras can see it. Verse 27, displeased the Lord. So I could hide it so my spouse doesn't know, my kids don't know, my parents don't know, my job doesn't know, the elders don't know, the pastors don't know. I could cover it. I know, but from his vantage point, he sees everything. Numbers 32, 23, I got to quote this all the time. Be sure, be sure your sin will find you out. I know, but it's been like six months and still nobody knows. I know. Your day is coming. If you don't deal with it today, your day is coming. I don't know about you. I'd rather deal with my sin privately than have it dealt with publicly. God will shout it from the rooftops. And so here's what happens. Uriah, he, she has the baby. Uriah is, I mean, this, things are piling up. Lust, adultery, murder, and that's what happens with sin. It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. He said, I, I would never do that. That's the Holy Spirit right there. I wouldn't, listen, if you are here today saying, I, I would never do something like David, you are a prime candidate. I could do that, you could do that, and it, why? Because the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful. Your heart is so deceitful, you just manipulate, you'll cover and hide it, and we have deceitful hearts. And here's what the enemy wants to say, hey, just one, one night of pleasure is not a really big deal. And he wants us to trade, he wants us to trade integrity and character for just one night of pleasure. This, can I just be honest with you? When I go home, I, after preaching four times, I can't watch like a love show. Or I, need, I need like a football game or like that show Cops. <laughs> I need to see some violence and arrests and stuff. And a couple months ago, I was watching Cops. Bad boy, bad boy, what you gonna do? What you gonna? And so I was watching this one episode and this gal, she's probably like mid-20s and her boyfriend or fiance or whatever, they, um, they, they, they steal somebody's car, hijack a car, get in the car, and the cops start chasing them. They're throwing out, like, cocaine bags out, out of the car. And they're, they're, they're running through red lights, and uh, ultimately the car crashes. <laughs> they didn't die, but the, the, I don't even know whose car it was, but, like, car crash, right? And, uh, and so they get out, and she's got, like, white powder. She's, like, trying to get it all. They got cocaine everywhere. And uh, they arrest her for a lot of things, right? Battery and uh, uh, we're just piling up, right? And, uh, and then they put her handcuffs in the back, and she's like, no. Oh! I can't go to jail. I can't go to jail. Here's what she said. My babies. Who's going to watch out for my babies? And I thought to her, you should have thought about that before you were stealing somebody's car. You should have thought that before you crashed. You should have thought that before you got arrested. The wages of sin is death. Not physical death, but spiritual death. So Paul's gave me a great quote. John Piper said this. You can, you can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequence of your sin. How good preaching. You could choose to do anything you want. You cannot choose the consequences. My baby's my... I know, but should have thought that before. Sin always has consequences. If you hear the Holy Spirit just... Conv I, I, I've been convicted as I put this message together. So let me just have you... We're going to wrap it up in just a sec. Just a couple things about David's life. Check this out. His infant son dies. So God, God's going to forgive him. We're going to read about that in chapter 12 next week. His infant son dies. His oldest daughter, Amnon, raped his half-sister and David's daughter, Tamar. His son, Absalom, killed Amnon for the rape. His friend and son, Absalom, plotted together to take over the kingdom. And consequence after consequence after consequence after consequence. Check this out. Right now, if you would look at me right now, in your chair, there are three people. You're like, that's why it seems so crowded. Are you ready? There's three people. Number one, the person that you are, who you really are. Number two, the person, if you could avoid compromise and sin and just be real and authentic, the person you can become in Jesus. 
The third person is the person that you might be if you compromise and sin, it will take you down to a very dark and a devastating place. So about 16 years ago, a couple pastor friends of mine had affairs. Lost the church, lost their family, lost everything. Like, if they could do it, I could do it. So I wrote down a list. If Steve Abraham had an affair and committed adultery, I just thought about, man, all that Jesus Christ has done for me. Just like, how embarrassed I would be if the king that gave me everything, he died in my place. Would I still go to heaven? Probably. But just the shame I would put on Jesus and the body of Christ. I, I, I've had the privilege to speak to th thousands of people, junior high camps, high school camps, Spain, Africa, on and on, different countries. So think about all the people that I spoke to and they found out about what happened. Oh, he's just another pastor that did the same thing. Lose my church. I, I, can't, I can't really do anything else. I'm not like a fix-it guy. Probably go to Walmart, just pass out cards. I don't know. What am I, I going to do for a living? Think about the embarrassment it would bring on my kids. Oh, what's it? Your, your dad was the pastor. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. It was in the paper. For what? For sex. For sex? For a few minutes of pleasure. Is it really, really worth it? I could, I could tell you list of pastor after pastor after pastor, really well-respected, godly people that made really dumb decisions. So we can either cover our sin or we can come clean today and be honest. Any area of compromise, if you don't deal with the compromise, you deceive yourself. Deception turns into darkness. Darkness have undealt with devastating consequences. And unfortunately, you don't get to hear the story. You don't get the cards that come in. You don't, you're not sitting in counseling sessions with people in our church where a husband cheated on his wife, a wife cheated on us. Like we hear it all the time. I can prevent a divorce from taking place if you'll listen to this. We can prevent family being fractured. We can prevent somebody from losing their job. This is not a message for anybody else but for you. What is God saying to you today? Why are you going back to the Nile? Why are you drinking out of dirty rivers? God's already set you free. Would you stand to your feet right now? I want to pray over us and for us. Father, we thank you for your grace. God, thank you that there is no condemnation in those. There's, we, there's no con condemnation in the room. We all make mistakes. We already declared that. But there is conviction of the Holy Spirit. So God, would you wake us up today? Whether we're an elder, a pastor, we've been saved 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, it doesn't matter. Some of us have gone back to things that we should have never gone back to. A relationship, a friend, a bar, drinking, partying. Friends that we ne would never hang out with. Shows that we would have never watched five years ago, we're watching again. Music we would have never listened to two years ago, we're listening to it again. And we've rationalized it, we've justified it. And God, we've been reminded today, you are our standard. So God, I pray, even as we sang earlier, let this be more than just a song that we sing. Holy, 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 if we're not a holy people. Holy just means to be set apart, different. Not perfect, we're different than the world. Forgive us for just singing a song about the holiness of God and not living it out. We confess our sin. We take responsibility. We stop making excuses and justifying and rationalizing. At least, well, so-and-so did this and so-and-so. I'm not as bad as so -and -so. No, no. We take responsibility. We confess our sin to you. Heal us, we pray. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace, your word. Breathe into the fabric of this service a holy people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, hey, we're going to sing a song. And here's what I'm going to do. We're not done for like four minutes. If we have to start the clock late for the last service, I feel like we need to do this. During this service, we're going to sing a song. The, all the prayer team people are going to come up forward. And here, some of you need to get out of your seat. And you need to confess your sin to somebody. And it could be just like, hey, I've been lying recently. I don't know, but if I go forward, who, people might think, who cares what they think? Just be real. I, I've been compromising a little bit here. Because listen, can I go right to God? Yes, Hebrews 4.16. I can go boldly to the throne of uh, grace and find mercy. Yes. But the Bible also says in James, confess your sin to one another that you may be healed. We've got to tell somebody, hey, hold me accountable. I've just been slipping in this area. Per team people, would you come forward right now? Make yourselves available. And if you're here, we're going to sing one more song. We're not, we're not checking out. Please don't leave the service for another four minutes or so. If you need prayer, if you need to confess something, come forward during the song. You can even come right now. Let somebody pray with you, agree with you.
that today is a new day. Listen, today is a new day. I'm no longer bound by fear. I'm a son of God. You guys ready to sing? Okay, I'm going to invite you right now. Get out of your seats if you need prayer and come forward right now. The worship team is going to lead us in a song. Go ahead. Come on, get out of your seat right now. Move right now. Come forward. Let somebody pray with you. Would you just confess that?